I appreciate the invitation to be on this lecture ship and to speak in these series of lectures. Appreciate the congregation and, of course, Michael for directing this lectureship. Appreciate the elders and all of those that are involved in hosting this lectureship. You all do an excellent job and it is appreciated very much. One of the great things <clears throat> about coming to a lectureship is that you get to see so many people that you haven't seen since perhaps the last lectureship you were attending. It always makes you glad when you see people that you know and love and sad when they have to part. And then there's the case of Brother Terry Hightower. <clears throat> Brother Johnny Oxendine was writing with me uh, the other night, coming to the lectureship, and when we were in the parking lot and getting ready to come in, he got out of the car, and the last thing he said was, I hope Terry's not here yet. We'll, we'll have at least one quiet night. <laughs> no. no, we've been glad to see Terry. Let me give you just a quick... Uh, update, if I may, on John Rose. As many of you know, he was uh, blind in one eye and couldn't see out of the other, and uh, had uh, two eye surgeries, cataract surgeries. And the first one <clears throat> never really cleared up completely. It was a little blurry. It was better than it was, but the blurriness, they said, was due to uh, and astigmatism. And so they went ahead and later on did the second surgery. It's done fine. And uh, recently, I believe he had some other procedure done where they, he said, do some cutting. <laughs> I don't know what all that involves, but that was supposed to help or clear up the astigmatism. And the uh, doctor has said, that she didn't want to do any more than what she's already done, but that if it didn't clear it up, that he may have to uh, get some reading glasses to the first power, whatever they, that is, and uh, that's where, uh, where they stand right now. They are indeed appreciative of, and I would add my appreciation too, to the fact that uh, so many offered prayers and also sent some financial help uh, they did not have any insurance for that surgery, and uh, we all appreciate it very much. Theme of the lectureship, <coughs> innovations. According to Webster, the meaning of the word innovation is something newly introduced, new method, custom, device, etc., change in the way of doing things, and the question for consideration in this lesson concerns voting on elders. The word vote, when used as a noun, means a decision by a group on a proposal, resolution, bill, etc., or a choice between candidates for office expressed by a written ballot, voice, show of hands, etc. When used as a verb, intransitive, it means to express the will or a preference in a matter by ballot, voice, etc., give or cast a vote to declare a preference, wish, opinion, etc., and when used as a verb transitive, means to decide, choose, and act, or authorize by vote, to grant or confer by vote, or to support in voting. We're going to study this question under four basic headings. Number one, some problems concerning voting, number two, some passages concerning voting, number three, some principles concerning voting, and number four, some perversions concerning voting. First of all, some problems. In the San Jose Family Bulletin of the San Jose Church of Christ, Jacksonville, Florida, dated uh, December 13, 2000, in the heart-to-heart -heart column that was then written by Calvin Warpula, 
We read the following. <clears throat> this Sunday, the names of the men you nominated to be elders will be presented to the congregation. For the next two weeks, you can visit with these men, pray about our selection process, submit your evaluation of these men on or before January 7th, those men receiving a minimum of 60% approval rating with not more than 20% disapproval will be ordained on January 21st. Article continued. The Bible does not tell us, except by general principles, how to select men to be elders. The procedures we are following are scriptural, fair, democratic, impartial, and honorable. Church is selecting its own leaders. The men you want are the men that will be ordained. Further, he wrote, 39 men were nominated. Eight received the minimum threshold of 20 nominations. Three of those men declined to be considered at this time. The remaining five will be presented Sunday for your prayerful and thoughtful consideration. And then additionally, he wrote, these five men recognize they may not reach the 60% approval threshold required. Could be that they are not that well known or that the congregation thinks that they should grow more in their maturity, servant leadership, or personal qualities. If so, each of them will gladly accept that as a growth challenge to continue serving in the congregation, possibly later with more service, maturity, and experience they will have earned the congregation's approval. And lastly, he wrote this. Our present elders have requested that they also be subjected to the same approval criteria. They want to continue serving if the congregation wants them to continue. Their names will also be on the ballot for you to evaluate. This excellent precedent makes leadership accountable to the membership. I admire and respect our elders for requesting this evaluation. Now our question is, is voting on elders, as was done in this procedure, an unscriptural innovation, or is it a biblically authorized way of doing things? That leads us, number two, to some passages concerning voting. <clears throat> There's a biblical procedure for ordaining elders in every church, as we read about in Acts 14.23 and Titus 1.5. This procedure involves at least the following. Number one, a selection process. Number two, an examination process. And number three, an ordination process. So we want to look at some passages that set forth a biblical way of doing things concerning each of these procedures, beginning with the selection process. There are a number of passages in the Bible that set forth the biblical way of doing things when selecting men to be officers of the church. First, Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 26, Matthias was, quote, chosen to replace Judas to be numbered with the eleven apostles, according to verse 26, According to this passage, two men were selected for this office, but only one was ordained or chosen. The record says they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias, verse 23. Pronoun they refers to the disciples, of whom the number of names together were about 120, verse 15. The disciples appointed or selected, Joseph and Matthias, the American Standard Version, has put forward, instead of the word appointed, Barry's interlinear has set forth, instead of the word appointed. Second, Acts 6, 1 to 4. Seven men were selected to be appointed over the business concerning the church's daily ministration to widows. We read in verses 2 and 3 that the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, Look ye out among you seven men whom we may appoint over this business. J.W. McGarvey wrote, and I quote, The selection 
was made by the multitude, the appointment by the apostles. And then he said the distinction made between these two terms should not be overlooked. The term appoint is distinguished from the selection which precedes it. Thirdly, Acts 16, 1 to 3. Timothy was selected <clears throat> to travel with the Apostle Paul as an evangelist of and for the church. And the fact that him would Paul have to go forth with him, verse 3, was based on the fact that Timothy, according to verse 2, was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Fourth, 1 Corinthians 16, 1-4, Paul wrote concerning the collection for the saints, verse 1, verse 3, he said, When I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. The church approved by letters, that's a selection process. Those that Paul sent, that is appointed, to bring this liberality or collection to Jerusalem. Number five, 2 Corinthians 8, 16 to 24. Paul speaks of a brother whose praise is throughout all the churches, verse 18, who was also chosen or selected of the churches to travel with us. The us here is Paul and Titus. With the grace or contribution which is administered by us. These brethren were then said to be the messengers of the churches in verse 23. Next, look at the examination process. <clears throat> Again, there are a number of passages in the Bible that set forth the biblical way of doing things when examining the qualifications of men to be officers of the church. We go back to some of the same verses, beginning with Acts 1, 15 to 26. The men selected by the disciples as possible replacements for the apostle Judas were required to meet certain God-given qualifications before one could be ordained as an apostle. We read in verses 21 and 2, Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day, that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Then in Acts 6, 1 to 4, seven men were selected by the disciples for appointment over the business concerning the daily ministration of the church to widows. They were required by the apostles to be men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, that's verse 3, before they could be appointed over this business. Third, Acts 16, 1 to 3. Timothy was selected as an evangelist to travel with Paul based on the fact that he was well reported of by the brethren that were in Lystra and Iconium. Verse 2. Number 4, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 4. The men selected by the churches to bring their liberality to Jerusalem had to be approved by letters, according to verse 3. Then in 2 Corinthians 8. 16 to 24, Titus and the other brethren selected were then chosen as ministers or rather messengers of the churches, verse 23. They were oftentimes proved diligent in many things, according to verse 22. And then the sixth place, 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7 and Titus 1, 5 to 11. You have qualifications for the office of a bishop, 1 Timothy 3, 1 that are specified so that Timothy and Titus and others could ordain elders in every city, Titus 1.5. That leads us to number three, the ordination process. There are also passages in the Bible that set forth the biblical way of doing things concerning the ordination of officers in the church. McGarvey, again, made the following comment said the following statement is made concerning Paul and Barnabas while engaged in their first missionary tour. And then he quotes from Acts 14, 23. When they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord and on whom they believed. The term here rendered ordained is a compound of one word, 
in the Greek, meaning the hand, another meaning to stretch forth. And its primary meaning is to stretch forth the hand. From the fact that bodies of men frequently expressed a choice by an elevation of the hand, it acquired the meaning of to choose or to be appointed by an extension of the hand. And then he said, finally, it came to mean to appoint without reference to the method of appointing. Such is the testimony of scholars, and it is confirmed by the usage of the term. He said it occurs in only one other place in the New Testament, where it is said of an unnamed brother whom Paul sent to Corinth with Titus, that he was chosen by the churches, 2 Corinthians uh, 7.19. How the church is chosen, whether by a show of hands or in some other way, he said is not determined by this term, nor by the context. And then he said another instance of its use is found in Josephus, who represents a Syrian king claiming jurisdiction over Judea, is writing to one Jonathan, the brother of Judas Maccabeus, these words, quote, We therefore do ordain thee this day, high priest of the Jews. Here he said there was no stretching out of the hand, but an appointment to office by a single individual and through the instrumentality of a letter. Then McGarvey commented on Paul's statement to Titus, Titus 1.5, where Paul said, I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. Said the term here rendered ordain is the Greek word most commonly used in both the New Testament and the Greek version of the Old Testament for appointing to office. It is used to express the appointment of Joseph as governor over Egypt and of other officers under him in the book of Genesis as well as Acts 7 for the appointment of David as ruler over Israel in 2 Samuel, for the appointment of rulers over household servants in Matthew, of a judge in civil jurisprudence, both in the Old Testament book of Leviticus and the New Testament book of Acts, and of Jewish high priest in the Hebrew letter. Thus he said, with the universal consent of scholars and critics, we render it a point rather than the word ordained. Titus then was to appoint elders in every city, according to McGarvey. Now, thirdly, some principles concerning voting. There are some general principles announced in the Bible for all that we do, and that would include the selection, examination, and appointment of elders. Colossians 3.17 Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Secondly, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Thirdly, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Then some procedures advocated. Based on the general principles just listed, in a book entitled Family of God, A Study of the New Testament Church, Batsell Barrett Baxter advocated the following procedure for selecting elders and deacons. And he wrote, and I quote, No <clears throat> specific plan is outlined in the scriptures for the selection of elders and deacons. Matter is left to the judgment of the Christians in any local congregation. In the absence of a prescribed plan, it may be helpful to make a few general suggestions about a method that has been used extensively and does work well. Let me make a side note here. In the years that I have been preaching, I have uh, served also as an elder in three separate uh, congregations. And just on that basis, I can to some extent testify that this is used extensively and it does work well. He continued, first step, choose a small group of men who are not themselves eligible to become elders or deacons. These men then become the receiving body to receive the names of those whom the congregation feels are qualified to serve 
either as elders or deacons. Of course, if the congregation already has elders and is seeking to appoint additional ones, the present elders would be this receiving group. Second step, instruct the congregation very carefully in the qualifications set down in the scriptures for both elders and deacons. Then, the members of the church are asked to look among themselves and to suggest the names of men who meet these scriptural qualifications. Their suggestions should be submitted in writing to the receiving group, and the list should be signed. Step three is for the receiving group to contact each person <clears throat> put forward to see if he himself knows any scriptural reason why he should not serve, and also to see if he is willing to serve if appointed to the office. Step four, to put the names of the men thus nominated and cleared before the congregation for a period of time so that their qualifications may be carefully analyzed and studied. Members of the congregation should be asked to submit in writing any scriptural objections to any person who has been put forward as a possible elder or deacon. If such scriptural objections are put forward, the receiving group must then investigate the charges, make a decision as to their validity, and then either leave the name on the list or remove it from the list. Again, just a personal side note. Uh, one of the congregations where I was eventually appointed as an elder, in addition to being the preacher, was uh, in Jacksonville, and uh, there was an objection lodged against me on the grounds that I was the preacher, and the preacher could not serve as an elder. Well, <laughs> I simply wrote out some biblical passages refuting that, uh, left it to the men to make a decision. They, of course, made the decision that it was not valid as an objection, and I was eventually appointed. But uh, the objections need to be handled, and handled correctly. If, on the other hand, after a reasonable length of time, this is step five, these men are eventually cleared in that sense, there needs to be a public announcement that the men whose names have been put forward and who have passed careful examination are now to serve as elders or deacons of the congregation. Now let's apply some of these principles. First, in the process of selecting possible officers, whether they be apostles, elders, deacons, evangelists, messengers, etc., for congregations, the disciples always did the selecting. L.R. Wilson, in a book entitled Congregational Development, said this, It is evident from the above scriptures that the church, not a pope, not a diocese, not a conference, was to select her own officers. Now, since the word vote, by definition, means a decision, a choice, to express the will, to declare preference, wish, or opinion, to decide, choose, and act, or authorize, to grant, or confer, to support, then by that definition there was and there is a vote by members of local congregations in the process of selecting men as possible elders of and for local congregations. But Wilson added this comment, let no one get excited at the words vote and nominate. We are not advocating democratic or congregational government. Two points need to be proclaimed here. Number one, this vote, so-called, does not appoint or ordain men, whether they're qualified or unqualified, to the eldership. Secondly, this vote, so-called, does not remove men, qualified or unqualified, from the eldership. This process simply selects men as possible elders. Secondly, in the process of examining potential officers, again, whether they be apostles, elders, deacons, evangelists, messengers, etc., or any local congregation, there were and there are at least 
three stages of examination. To begin with, the disciples who select men as possible elders make their own examination, or at least they should, based on biblical qualifications of the men they select. Next, the men selected should make a self-examination based on biblical qualifications. And as a result of this self-examination, based on those biblical qualifications, the men selected will either remove themselves from consideration for the eldership or proceed to the next stage of the examination process. Finally, the whole congregation will make an examination, again, based on biblical qualifications of the men selected as potential elders to determine if they are qualified based on those biblical qualifications. If it is determined that they are qualified based on those biblical qualifications, then they can be appointed or ordained as elders. If they are accused of not being qualified, here's where 1 Timothy 5, 19, 20 comes in, then there must be an examination of the accusations. But again, based on biblical qualifications and the final determination as to whether the men are qualified or not. If it is determined that they are not qualified based on biblical qualifications, then they cannot be appointed or ordained as elders. If it is determined that the accusations are unfounded, again based on biblical qualifications, then they can be appointed or ordained as elders. Once again, since the word vote by definition means a decision, choice, to express the will, to declare preference, wish, or opinion, to decide, choose, and act, or authorize, to grant or confer, to support, then by definition, again there was, there is a vote by members of local congregations in the process of examining men as possible elders of and for the local congregation. But again, the two previous points need to be pressed. First, this vote, so-called, is not to appoint or ordain unqualified men based on biblical qualifications to the eldership. And secondly, this vote, so-called, is not to remove qualified men based on biblical qualifications from the eldership. Thirdly, in the ordination process, the men that have been selected and found to be qualified based on those biblical qualifications are simply appointed or ordained to the eldership. In this process, there is no vote authorized by the Bible either to prevent men who have been selected by the congregation and been found qualified based on biblical qualifications from being appointed or ordained to the eldership. And further in this process, there is no vote authorized by the Bible to remove men from the eldership when they are qualified based on biblical qualifications or to keep them from continuing to serve as elders when they are qualified based on biblical qualifications. Only when men are selected, examined, and appointed to the eldership based on biblical qualifications can it be said, as in Acts 20:28, 20, that the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Now, lastly, some perversions concerning voting. San Jose Congregation <clears throat> stated, and I again quote, the procedures we are following are scriptural, fair, democratic, impartial, and honorable. I say not so. In reality, the San Jose Congregation perverted the scriptural principles concerning the selection process the examination process, and the ordination process. First of all, in the selection process, remember, 39 men were nominated. Only eight received the minimum threshold of 20 nominations. This obviously means that 31 men never made it past the selection process, even though they might have possibly met all the biblical qualifications for elders. So much for being scriptural and fair. Then in the examination, they called it the evaluation process. 
instead of examining or evaluating the qualifications of these men based on biblical qualifications, the process was perverted by changing specifically stated biblical qualifications into ambiguously stated but required man-made qualifications such as, quote, well-known, or again, quote, maturity, or again, quote, servant leadership, or again, quote, personal qualities. It was stated, these five men recognized that they may not reach the 60% approval threshold required it could be, that they are not that well known or that the congregation thinks that they should grow more in their maturity, servant leadership, or personal qualities. Thus, instead of examining the biblical qualifications of these men, this process was perverted by changing it into an unauthorized, democratic popularity vote. It was stated again, those men receiving a minimum of 60% approval rating with not more than 20% disapproval, will be ordained on January 21st. Concerning those men who were not popular enough, it was stated, quote, possibly later with more service, maturity, and experience, they will have earned the congregation's approval. All of this obviously means that men who might possibly have been biblically qualified to be ordained as elders were not ordained because they did not meet the unscriptural, man-made threshold of 60% approval rating, or they had more than the unscriptural, man-made threshold of 20% disapproval rating. This obviously means that men who might not have been biblically qualified to be ordained as elders were unscripturally ordained, because they did meet the unscriptural, man-made threshold of 60% approval rating, and did not have more than the unscriptural man-made threshold of 20% disapproval rating. So much for being impartial and honorable. I've often wondered what threshold Matthias had. During the ordination process, not only was it possible that biblically qualified men were not ordained as elders, and or that biblically unqualified men were ordained as elders, it was also possible that biblically qualified men already serving as elders were removed from office. It was stated, our present elders have requested that they also be subjected to the same approval criteria. They want to continue serving if the congregation wants them to continue. Their names will also be on the ballot for you to evaluate. San Jose congregation concluded their unscriptural man-made perversions of the selection process and the examination process and the ordination process for elders by stating this. This excellent precedent makes leadership accountable to the membership. Now the Bible teaches that the shepherds of a congregation are accountable to the chief shepherd and that the members are accountable to both the chief shepherd and their congregations, shepherds, according to Hebrews 13, verses 7 and 17, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. Thus, what the San Jose congregation practiced was indeed a precedent, but it was also an innovation, an unauthorized way of doing things that involved unauthorized voting on elders. <laughs>